Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for showing up to the VA meeting. We have a, a number of folks online too. We have uh, kind of a, a big agenda today, which is really nice because we often had not had you know such a uh, a nice packed agenda. Um, Do you have to push this to I, this is working, right? You guys can hear me fine. You guys can hear me online. Yeah, Tom says I we can. So uh, I think we're going to jump right into it. We'll get to some of the, the mechanics later, but we're going to start out with uh, three protocol presentations that uh, will impact um, the VA. We hope to get you know VAs to uh, open these studies and accrue to these studies because they, they look like good candidates for, for our veterans. And then uh, we're going to have Dr. Liss give us a presentation on the storefront that just got funded uh, and their progress. And then we'll get into some other uh, details about the committee and, and things that we're working on moving forward. So um, our first uh, presenter is going to be Dr. Tom Chauncey, who's going to present remotely. Uh, Tom, I will be advancing your slides. Um, so you can just unmute, right? And then just unmute, and then I can start. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so I'm guessing that uh, Christine Yee or Sikander Alawadi are not here. Is that correct? Um, yeah, uh, that's that's what Sharon tells me. Okay, so I'm just going to give a thumbnail. Would I and then talk? I don't know if you have my other slides, but it's not that important. I can talk. Uh, just summarize what I presented to the myeloma committee, which I think is is as important, if not more, than the specific protocol. Yeah, but I don't think give, we have those, Tom. That's fine. That's fine. I I think um, I can go over it, and I think. Everyone here are is familiar with the issues. So, this is uh, 2209, which is uh, chaired by uh, Dr. Alawadi and Dr. Yi, and I'm the VA representative. And it's for older non-transplant eligible patients with myeloma. And uh, next slide. It it's addresses. Uh, keep going. I'm just going to hit the high points. So it, uh, it looks at two commonly used uh, regimens in this uh, transplant ineligible group, uh, DRD with our maintenance, which is the, uh, which is the uh, Maya trial mm -hmm. and RVD light with-, with um, Can you hang on just a second? Our time? maintenance, yeah, go ahead. I see someone can't hear me. Yeah. Steve, you can hear me, right? Yeah, we can hear you here. Uh, okay. Um, okay, we're good. Next. Sorry. Okay, good. All right. So this is really the crux of it. It's uh, DRD, our maintenance, as in Maya, RVD light with our maintenance, which is... Uh, a fairly common regimen for many people in, old, in the transplant ineligible. And then one of the twists here, and this gets into some nuances that I, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the, question, the maintenance question, which is something that's being asked in many settings, is what the optimal maintenance is transplant eligible or transplant ineligible. And if you look at the difference, the only difference between ARM2 and ARM3 is R maintenance versus DARA R maintenance. So DR versus R. Next slide. Uh, patients are, have to be frail or intermediate fit. There's an online uh, assessment according to the Palumbo criteria. Next slide. And the, these are the primary objectives, looking at PFS, ARM1, ARM2, and OS versus 1.3, which is the difference in ma different maintenance arms. Next slide. Okay, next slide. 
Well, okay. I um, there's a quality of life component, which is very important, especially in this population. Next slide. I realize I'm glancing over a lot of critical things, but for now, I just want to get through, get get the high points out. And then this is a component which has become key to uh, many myeloma studies, and that is the role of MRD, assessing MRD, the predictability of MRD, what MRD means in terms of response, PFS, and OS. And in this, you know, there's different ways to look at MRD in this particular trial, as in some others, it's with the commercial clonoseq assay. And that actually is going to segue into some of the challenges we're facing within the VA. Uh, but this is not the only trial looking at using clonoseq, and it's certainly not the only one looking at MRD assessment. Um, I think that's probably all I'm going to say about the actual protocol. And then I want to speak in more general terms. Um, you can put up whatever slide you'd like. Um, just to, in terms of what I, I, I don't think we need to keep going through this right now. But um, so I presented to the myeloma committee, and what I said was that, you know, what I had to say was relevant not just for 2209 and not just for myeloma, uh, but for all cooperative group trials, and that is the issue of doing V8. Doing having VA participation in CTEP to prove cooperative group trials. And, you know, we, I'm pre literally preaching to the choir this morning that, you know, VA has a population that on the whole is aging, it's predominantly male, which means that, you know, these are target diseases that we need to be addressing. Now, the clonoseq assay in particular, but there are others, highlights a problem that I think many of you are aware of, and Steve and I have talked at length, and, and Stephanie McGowan, our data manager, is on the call, and I have spoken at length with a number of people, senior people in VA, local people, and that is that my understanding was that there was really a mandate, a national mandate, that VA would cover costs associated with CTEP-approved cooperative trials. But what we're seeing in my own institution and others is that different departments are balking at covering some of these costs. Specifically in my institution, uh, they said they don't want to pay, the pathology department doesn't want to pay for the clonoseq assay. And there are other reports elsewhere of uh, pharmacy not wanting to pay for certain drugs on other SWOG studies. And you know, it could be pharmacy, it could be pathology, it could be, you know, radiology, not wanting to pay for a PET scan or something. But that is a very serious problem. And I don't, I, one of the things that I want to discuss, not just in terms of 2209, but how we can address this and what pressure we can bring to bear. <clears throat> one of the debates that comes up is clinical versus research. And, you know, I, I have my own ideas on that. That's a, it's a big question, but my understanding is that if this was going to work or, and the mandate was that this was VA clinical dollars, just like a th any other third party payer would cover these costs. I think it becomes a very slippery slope once you start taking money from research dollars to pay for clinical trials and cooperative groups. And I think you erode the you erode the funds and the resources in the in the research uh, coffers that were probably not designed for that. But that's kind of an open question. And regardless of what I might think or what Steve might think, how do we how can we uh, how can we bring this issue to bear on the people that can make a decision? So I think that's what I had to say. We can talk a little more about the trial itself, but the bigger issue goes beyond, bigger issues go beyond 2209 and beyond myeloma. Yeah, and um, I, I, Sharon shared something with me before the meeting that I think we'll get to later in the agenda 
of uh, a tool that we can use through CTSU to maybe make the argument uh, more convincing to leaders. Um, but yeah, it's it's not just 2209. We had it with 1800D in some settings. And um, so it is something that needs to, to really go up the chain and have some authority behind it to say, you know, we will pay for the same things Medicare will pay for. So if if not more. So um, so let's go with some questions about the trial for Dr. Chauncey. Any questions from the audience or online? Well, I, I actually just wanted to comment about the question related to uh, the paying for the for the uh, clonal seek assay. I wanted to let you know that on the administrative side of SWAG, we've been corresponding with, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, got to find his name again, <laughs> with, with uh, Dr. Grant Huang um, and discussing with him possibilities for getting this study, uh, this test covered. So for example, one of the issues that we see is that if this were a, usually the, um, if you're trying to provide a research test without cost for a subpopulation of participants in a clinical trial, it triggers Medicare third-party payer rules that say you cannot do that. If you're going to provide a test free to any participant in the trial, you have to provide it free for all of the participants. But there's a wrinkle here because it wouldn't be Medicare that would be paying for this test. What we want to do is ask the, the company that we're collaborating with, we haven't done that yet, we have no idea whether they'd say yes or no, but we, our, idea, our idea was that we would go to the company and ask them if they would pay for this test for this subpopulation in the VA. But then we have to make sure that um, uh, we're not triggering any sort of third party um, uh, payer issues. And so my question to to Grant and the VA is that because you're not, it's it's not the it's not Medicare that that would be affected here. It would be uh, the Veterans Administration, which is a completely separate third party payer than Medicare. Um, is there any way that we can do this and not violate those those Medicare payment rules? And he he promised to look into this. It's a complicated question, <laughs> and so he's been working with a lot of people. Um, and we don't have a definitive read on that yet, but I just wanted to let you know that we were exploring that. Yeah, I'm sure we'll probably have to talk to one in the VA is called the star attorneys or the, the research folks. And, um, but I, you know, Grant's got a lot of irons in the fire, so I'm gonna have to uh, probably nudge him a little bit. And then I can also nudge some of our star folks, which is, yeah, that's good information. I think that'd that, be great. That we can start working on that. Tom will be happy to hear that. Yeah, this bunker. Yeah, and I, I've got a couple comments. Um, I'm sorry, who was speaking there? I didn't. Tom, this bunker. I was trying to speak, but go ahead. No, no. Who who just spoke? Uh, oh, uh, uh, I, he's in the back of the room right now. I'm Nathan. Nathan Erickson. Yes, with the okay. Swag. And he's with the VA. No, he's with our SWOG uh, chair's office. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Yes, as you know, and I, I know Sharon knows, and Steffi and I met with Grant probably before you did. You know, one of the questions is, are we going down the right pathway? Because Grant is in research and not, but yeah, I, I, it's, I'm intrigued by what you said. Um, I want ClonoSeq for my non-study patients. I mean, I, I have, and, and not just throwing it out there to test everybody at six months, but I have some critical, critical patients, high-risk myelomas, plasma cell leukemias I'm treating, I can make clinical decisions, and I would like to look at MRD, and it's NCCN uh, approved, and I can't get anyone to run it. So, I mean, it is, I, again, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, I think we need to stay focused on what we're, what we want to accomplish, but, you know, this is, this is a big issue, uh, not just for research studies but yeah let's talk about research and try to make it uh, try to make it work and try to figure out if we're if grant wong and the research pathway are the right way to go but thank you for your comments and yeah. then I, I think pankaj had a question yeah sorry just wanted to sort of expand on that a little bit i think tom you and i have talked about the clonaseq as well and I, yes. I think it's a concern 
I mean, in principle, I think if there is a test which is FDA approved or NCCN approved for clinical purposes, I do think that the VA should cover it in the appropriate clinical setting. Um, naturally, we are all sensitive to resources, but the fact is that nowadays with all the treatments we have, you think about it in the big picture, you know, one month of any of our systemic therapies costs a lot more than any one of these single tests, which we use to make that decision. So from a fiscal perspective as well, it makes total sense. Now, in the big picture, I uh, this is a, as many of us are uh, involved with the Navigate program, and then the whole premise of the Navigate program is to create an infrastructure for veterans participating in NCI-sponsored studies. And that whole program is set up on that premise. So we are a site for Navigate. So I brought this big is issue up as a bigger issue for all NCI-sponsored studies, which are federal taxpayer-sponsored studies, in the spirit of the Navigate program uh, on the National Navigate calls, which uh, Grant attends and NCI leadership attends as well. So what I have suggested is that we reach between VA central office and the NCI, we reach an agreement that just like we do for CSP, VA cooperative studies program studies, those, everything is covered by the VA. If a CSP study is approved, that's again a federal study. So what I've suggested is that we reach an, an, uh, an MOU with the NCI and hopefully with the DOD as well, that all NCI-sponsored studies will come under the same umbrella, that all federally funded studies will be treated like CSP studies and the costs of veterans participating in those are covered, just like they are for CSP studies. So now the issue, one of the issues, as, as you alluded to, it brings up is sort of VA research dollars versus clinical dollars. So it's not a decision which Grant and his office can take, uh, but uh, I am hopeful that, you know, we've started that conversation and uh, I, I think that's going to help not only with this study, but across the board, because we come up with this all the time. In, for example, at Long Beach, we have to do these impact estimation worksheets for radiology, pharmacy, pathology. And the question comes up that who's going to pay for that? Now, the monies that we get from SWOG or any NCI studies are just a token payment, really. They don't even pay for you know one scan or one month of drug. So we do need to have a, a if we really want the VA to continue and enhance participation of veterans in NCI funded studies, I think this is a critical issue. And it needs to be addressed not, I don't think on a study by study basis, but more in a global manner. And we have the opportunity to do that in the spirit to navigate, which both organizations are committed to. So uh, let's see um, if we, you know, hopefully we'll make some headway on that, but those are just my thoughts. Yeah, and certainly they're rolling out, a, you know, an expansion of navigate. So this might be kind of the perfect time to make that point very clear that navigate's not gonna work either in like its existing form or its expanded form if we don't provide that kind of coverage. Um, and it's probably we need to take something up to um, Dr. Ramoni, uh, you know, work with Grant and, and Rachel. And uh, I think she would be uh, definitely would love to hear this. And she's the one that can kind of advance it kind of outside of ORD saying, you know, this is what we need to do. Um, and so there's some, some folks there that we can definitely talk to. And I, I think we just need to, you know, get everybody in a room and walk the door and- um, Don't let them out. <laughs> don't, sir, and just, you know, give them a lot of water. And then- um, <laughs> Right, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, white smoke. White, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so uh, we will work on that for for uh, not just 2209, but you know certainly all the other things. And and like I said, uh, Sharon sh showed me a tool this morning that I didn't even know was there in CTSU that helps identify coverage of of you know what Medicare and others uh, will pay for. So um, I think we kind of need to get moving. Anything else, Tom? Well, yeah, no, I mean, you know, this is deja vu all over again. You know, we, we've been this pathway <laughs> and there have been MOUs 
And I, the the reason I mention that is because hopefully we can, you know, we I can dig some of those up, and they're they're a, they're also a starting point because we we've been this road before, and right. we thought it was resolved. I thought it was resolved before I started working on twenty two oh nine. So, I I mean, some of the work has been done. Uh, they may people may decide they want a new MOU, but. Uh, we've been this pathway before. Yeah, I, I think we need to, I think that old MOU, uh, I'm trying to remember who wrote that. It was like early 2000s uh, that, you know, VA would cover yeah. everything. But I, I think it's kind of either expired or there's just been so right. much but turnover. The in ORD still there. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. So one of the, the things that comes up, like on our impact estimation worksheets, for instance, and again, I raised it on the Navigate call to ask for, you know, uh, guidance from Grant and others is uh, on the impact estimation worksheet, you write out the various things. And it says there's a checkbox that is the funding internal or external. And to me, that's become a little confusing because if we say the VA is going to cover these, then theoretically it's VA internal funding. However, it's not a VA grant or it's not a VA project. So, you know, there's some confusion in the field about uh, this. And I think some consistent consistency will be accomplished by guidance and, and some consensus uh, at the central level. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think this has to come from, otherwise you're gonna have every individual lab, pharmacy kind of make decisions on the fly based on today's budget estimations, so. Are there any chats that had questions or uh, comments that just were appropriate? About just about opening studies in general, and we'll get to that later. So any other questions or comments on 2209? All right, a uh, little bit of housekeeping before I move on, because I failed to do this. I failed to introduce myself and Leslie. Um, so <laughs> I'm Steve Barlett. I'm uh, the chair of the VA committee. I, I hail from uh, the Denver area, the Rocky Mountain Regional VA Medical Center. Um, and Leslie's uh, from San Antonio, and she's the one that keeps me on the straight and narrow on a daily basis. I try. As, as best you can with, <laughs> with hurting butterflies. It's not too hard. Yeah. I'm with the Swag Operations Office and membership. Yeah, and she, she's uh, been a critical component of, of keeping everything going and moving forward and putting this meeting together. Um, there's sign-up sheets uh, around the room, please sign in so that we know you were here. Those online capture you after the meeting that you attended and um, certainly you know, spread the information about our group and um, we encourage everybody's participation. All right, so uh, Dr. Redcamp, are you ready? I am, thank you. Let me get to your slides. I gotta get through. So I wanna thank Chow for inviting me today. I'm here from the Lung Committee. That's fine, you can start on this slide. And uh, I actually started my career with a CDA through the VA um, at the West Los Angeles VA. Um, right now I'm at uh, Cedars-Sinai and I'm the chair of S2302, also called Pragmatica Lung, which if you've been at the meeting, you've probably heard a few times. And um, hopefully this is a trial that overcomes a lot of the, the issues that we've just been discussing about how do we pay for things and how do we uh, make things more uh, just part of standard of care. So this is a trial that um, grew out of our S1800A 18, uh, that was run through the lung map trial and was presented at ASCO last year. And this was that was a remiserumab and pembrolizumab versus standard of care, but the standard of care was pre prescribed as single agent chemotherapy or docetaxel remiserumab. And that study showed an improvement in overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.69 and uh, about, about a three month improvement in overall survival, 14.5 versus 11.6 months in the standard of care arm. And that was a robust, randomized phase two trial, but it was thought that there was there, there would need to be a phase three trial in order to bring this combination into the clinic. And this is for patients who have received prior chemotherapy and immunotherapy with recurrent or, um, or stage four non-small cell lung cancer. So this is an area where we'd have limited uh, treatment options. 
So based on that, um, we came together with CTEP and the FDA and tried to come up with what we call a pragmatic trial. And the, the key piece was that we, again, we had a phase two trial. We saw overall survival improvement without a pro progression-free survival improvement. And we know from ramucirumab and pembrolizumab across many, many diseases that the toxicities, we know what the toxicities are and felt that we didn't need to characterize those in a meaningful way. And from the phase two study, we saw that uh, standard of care chemotherapy had more toxicity than the combination of ramucirumab and pembrolizumab and the overlapping tox toxicities were really um, insignificant. Um, so we have this trial randomized to standard of care versus ramucirumab and pembrolizumab, and the standard of care is not pre prescribed. It is based on what the investigator would normally choose, and we guide them to the NCCN guidelines, but it is really based on what they would normally choose. Next slide. And so again, this is just the background, what we talked about because of the phase two trial, we wanted to have a, uh, a pragmatic trial that decreased the burden of trial participation. So you can see, you'll see from our eligibility that um, it's promoting inclusion of participants and also decreasing the burden on sites. Next slide. And again, our pragmatic design to empower investigators to treat patients as they would in the real world. And sometimes you hear real world studies that are more retrospective in nature, showing what we have done. And this is a prospective real world study, letting physicians treat their patients as they normally would. We have put in a, a lot of uh, things in place to decrease barriers to enrollment and really to minimize the data, data collection burden. And this is a registrational trial, so very novel for oncology. Um, Many of these trials have been done in cardiology, um, diabetes, other tumor types, but really in oncology and for registration, um, these trials, uh, the trials get more complicated rather than less. So really we're asking one question, what is the over or is the overall survival improved with the experimental therapy? Next slide. So again, our study objectives, just two, comparing overall survival between the two arms, and then summarizing reports of serious and unexpected high grade, greater than grade three, treatment-related adverse events. And in looking at our S1800A trial, we believe this is going to be less than 10% of the AE reporting that you would do at a normal, uh, in a normal phase three trial. Next slide. And this is a busy slide. It's not for you to uh, know everything on the slide, but I think the purpose of it is that this is all of the eligibility. There are no more eligibility. The eligibility really get to the heart of prior treatment. They have to have prior immunotherapy and they have to have at least stable disease on prior immunotherapy. So we're looking at acquired resistance and not the patients with primary resistance. So 84 days, they have to have been on immunotherapy and have at least stable disease. And in uh, non-small cell lung cancer, we're now treating in the perioperative setting, adjuvant, neoadjuvant, um, consolidation after chemo radiation. And we're allowing those patients, and if they um, progress within a year, that that immunotherapy would be included as their um, immunotherapy to move on to this trial. They can only have one prior immunotherapy. This is not for patients who have gotten multiple lines of immunotherapy, again, and not approved in non-small cell lung cancer, but um, they wouldn't allow those types of patients. We do allow patients with sensitizing mutations as long as they've been treated with the appropriate uh, uh, inhibitor, um, but they have to also have the immunotherapy and chemotherapy eligibility met which many of the things like EGFR, ALK, maybe wouldn't have met the, uh, the criteria for acquired resistance on immunotherapy and prior chemotherapy. And the other important thing is that we have a broad performance status of zero to two, which is uh, uncommon in non-small cell lung cancer immunotherapy trials. Next slide. There may be a pop-up here. So you could click twice probably. One more time. And again, the standard of care is based on what the investigator would normally choose. 
and we guide you to NCCN, but we do not have a pre-prescribed um, standard of care arm, and they should be administered as according to the FDA package inserts and according to institutional guidelines. So we do not, there are no um, deviations for uh, infusion times or things like that. There's no collection of those types of things. Pre-medications are based on your institutional guidelines. So a lot less um, places for potential deviations. Next slide. The remesirumab and pembrolizumab are uh, covered and uh, provided by uh, CTEP in this trial, and they're given on the standard 21-day cycle, and um, again, we do labs as we would per their package inserts, um, but nothing is specifically pre prescribed in the protocol, and we don't collect that information in case report forms. Next slide. So then here comes the study calendar. And again, it's all a busy slide, but this is the study calendar. There is no more. And I think that um, as far as an investigator and thinking about conduct of the trial, ultimately it will be easy because you do what you normally would do within your clinic and within your practice. Um, and again, it should minimize uh, cost to any site, the VA or any site. Um, I think what's been hard is in the startup process, we have amazing coordinators that work with us and they go to the protocol and they go to the study calendar and they say, where are the labs? Where are the scans? Where are the things that I'm normally um, looking for? And so we've been talking about this, especially at the SWOG meeting this year, and probably will come up with a worksheet that sites can put together to um, document what they think they'll do for their patients. It's really standard of care. I think for most patients, we would be getting labs every uh, cycle, every three weeks, every cycle, and uh, scans about every um, usually about every three cycles, at least every three months. Um, but again, limits what uh, would have extra cost to any system. Um, so really vital status assessment for, um, for, uh, for evaluating overall survival and the SAE assessment are the main pieces. Next slide. And I think click twice again. Um, and then, so we have very simplified data reporting and forms. We have a reduction in the, the number of time points, a reduction in the number of forms, and the number of data elements. We don't include tissue specimen collection. We don't include image submission or recist reads. Um, and there are no patient reported outcome instruments. Um, we do have a pathology form that we want completed and uploaded and uploading of their NGS forms um, for their um, demographic information at uh, the start of treatment, but um, nothing, no, no specific tissue collection. Next slide. I think these are just kind of informational. This is, this is again, uh, all of the forms that we have for the study. There are no other case report forms. So at baseline, we have a number of forms to get the information and, and demographics and prior treatment. Um, on treatment, we have the vital status and adverse event forms. Um, off treatment within 30 days, again, vital status and treatment summary forms, late adverse events and the vital status forms that continue and that at the time of death, the notice of death form. Next slide. I think I show uh, some of these slides we can go through. These are just the simplified reporting. Again, alive, dead, um, date of assessment, and is the patient still receiving protocol treatment, and any reportable adverse events during this time. Next slide. Oh, you could keep clicking, sorry. Um, the adverse event form, and again, we're trying to this is very different than what people are used to filling out for NCTN or most studies. And so these are unexpected and treatment related. And so for if a patient has uh, grade three pneumonitis um, from the immunotherapy, that would not necessarily be um, unexpected. And uh, so it would not necessarily be reportable. So there are very, very few adverse events that are actually reportable. All grade five uh, would be reportable. Next slide. Um, and again, here's our study treatment forms. It, it goes through what the patient has actually been treatment with, whether they had a, an adverse event, um, and uh, whether they're still receiving study therapy. 
Next slide. And then the notice of death form, but highly simplified. Next slide. Um, and we upload a pathology report. We upload the PDL1 and NGS reports, um, but uh, not radiology and not uh, specific tissue. Next slide. Informed consent can be remote, um, and there's a whole process for that. Next slide. And uh, there is increased funding for this trial as it's a registrational trial, but the auditing process and, uh, and again, burden of data submission is a lot less than most trials. So hopefully the funding for this trial will be more in line with, uh, with what the, the work is asked to be, that's asked to be done. And there's, uh, we ask that you get try to get squad, SWOG credit for entering patients into this trial. Next slide. We are trying to increase our recruitment efforts and try, trying to evaluate our ability to recruit from underrepresented groups. We have a firm that we're working with who will be um, producing a patient a, a educational awareness materials. All patient content will be um, translated into Spanish. We're engaging our patient uh, advocacy organizations and have additional materials for support and awareness. We will uh, start monthly site support calls, especially for those sites with underrepresented groups. And uh, we'll be having newsletters to recognize high accrual, diverse accrual, and best practices. Next slide. We'll be specifically um, evaluating um, enhanced outreach for sites with high participants with uh, underrepresented groups. We'll be monitoring the representativeness of the enrolled population throughout the trial and get uh, targeted uh, enrollment or, or, or targeted outreach and support for these. Next slide. And there are there is some work to get patient reimbursement. Um, we don't have this in place yet, but we're uh, we're looking at um, gift cards, which kind of decrease the burden on the site and decrease the burden on the patient for reporting. And um, this is something that is actively um, being evaluated, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to put this into place. It has not been uh, standard in SWOG studies that uh, that we have seen. Next slide. Um, again, resources on the CTSU uh, website, and they're working on patient-friendly uh, trial summary and uh, social media toolkit, um, and um, some help with EMR templates and EMR compliance for local institutions. Next slide. And I, I just want to thank everybody who's been involved. We have support from both Merck and Lilly for this. We have uh, all of our NCI and CTEP partners, um, NCTN, all of the NCTN groups have been uh, uh, very excited and partnering with us from Alliance with our co-chair, uh, Constantine Dragneb. And we have uh, champions from ECOG Akron and Energy Oncology. The FNIH has helped to move this forward as this grew out of our lung map process and Friends of Cancer Research, um, again, have been highly supportive and helping to push this through. We have our uh, SDMC who has been um, amazing in helping us to make sure we run this correctly and Mary Redmond as our lead statistician and her whole team and our project ma manager, Mariah Norman. And uh, with that, I, I Thank you for listening and thank you for your support of this. I think um, the VA sites will be, uh, this This should be a trial that uh, resonates with many, many patients. These are most of our patients that we see that are uh, end up being refractory to immunotherapy and chemotherapy and hopefully um, an ease of uh, conducting the trial at VA sites. All right, questions. I there, I know there's one question online that we have. Uh, if a site has us 1900E open, could they open this trial as well? Yes, and so this is a trial. So if they were, if a patient was on 1900E, which is our KRAS, uh, our lung map trial that um, puts KRAS patients on sotorasib, they could potentially get this after the sotorasib. And so it's not uh, overlapping in that way. And so at this moment in time, this is really, we don't have an unmatched substudy for the lung map 
protocol platform and uh, really are promoting this study right now for our unmatched patients because that is the cohort of patients that should go on to this trial. Um, it really should fit for many, many patients. I think this could help boost accrual at any site that's looking to uh, increase their accrual as many of our sites are trying to do. And again, reducing burden on our staff, which I think we're all struggling with in the post COVID era. Any other questions in the room? Can I make a comment? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi, Karen. Thank you very much for presenting. Was there one online? I'm sorry. I think it's Chow is talking. This is Chow from Kansas City. It's a thing. Yeah, I can barely hear you. I can, I'll repeat it if you can hear me. Yes, absolutely. Okay, I'll repeat what he says. Yeah, so I just want to, uh, again, uh, thank Karen for presenting. I thought this was a, you know, the right study for the VA setting with reduction in paperwork and reduction of the labor that goes into the research coordinators to do the study. And I think it, it, the VA sites that do clinical trial, I think the ideal study to do it since you will provide the study drugs and the standard of care is, is what we use in the, in the real life, in the real world setting. Thank you. Thank you. So he, he was just stating um, that this is should be a, a good trial for the VA setting with the with the non-prescribed uh, standard of care that people can use what they use in their institution, and that we provide the invest both of the investigational drugs, um, and we have limited uh, data collection for this study. So thank you. Yeah, I I agree with that. Maybe not this study, but future studies that are kind of designed around this model might be really good for our node sites and some of the other things that we're doing with LPOP and, and other things where we might not always be using the academic affiliated medical center, but maybe our more remote centers, like in our case in Colorado, we have Grand Junction, who could very well do clinical trials. Um, and this would be a perfect fit for them. Uh, Cheyenne might be Another one where um, you know they give standard chemotherapy, and we just need to to uh, you know, as we all say, bring research to the patient instead of the patient to the research. So I think that's the goal, and I think SWAG is trying, and I think all the NCTN groups are trying to have a more balanced portfolio and pulling in these types of pragmatic trials where it makes sense. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you. Uh, last chance for questions or comments. All right, we'll move on to the next one. Dr. O'Dwyer is here in, in person with us today. And yeah, please come up here. Okay. I'm just gonna make sure I didn't miss a chat question. I think we're good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I can use, can yep, I can do that. <laughs> so I'm Kristen O'Dwyer. I'm a medical oncologist. I hail from the University of Rochester Medical Center in Rochester, New York. So, and I'm, I'm a member of the Leukemia Committee, and you might be wondering why we're going to talk about uh, a very rare form of ALL. Um, but I, in my own clinic, I have several um, active service members with ALL, um, and their journey has been um, has really left an impression on me. And even though they're young adults, they were active duty at the time of their diagnosis. So when we were writing this trial and once we had it approved and we're thinking of other patients and I'll get into why we think the VA committee could could help us if you wanted to participate, um, that it, it would be a really important study for any young patient who has this really rare but yet curable disease. It just takes quite a bit to cure this. So that is our hope. So we have designed a trial, a randomized phase two trial of chemotherapy plus or minus a BC, BCL2 inhibitor therapy for patients with TALL or T lymphoblastic lymphoma. And I am representing just many people who've participated in um, Sharon. We couldn't have done this trial and without Sharon, and she's really encouraged us to, to come and try to present to this committee as well. So just a little bit of background on our uh, recent 
experience with ALL. So this is the uh, Kaplan-Meier curve for overall survival base for our young adult patients with ALL. We does, we define, or the NCI defines young adult patients as ages 18 to 39. Um, and at the, the CLGB 10403 trial was a trial that was led by Dr. Wendy Stock at the University of Chicago. And when she made the seminal observation that young adult patients can benefit from receiving a pediatric inspired approach to their to their ALL regimen uh, versus the standard adult protocol. And so this was the first trial designed specifically for our young adult patients. Um, so our historical control data for uh, historical outcomes data for young adults treated with an adult type of regimen was about 50% survival. And just by changing the the component, not not adding a single new drug, no drug had been re-approved since the 70s for this type of therapy, but just changing the schedules and the dosing of the components in ALL therapy, going from how the pediatricians did it to our adult colleagues, um, increased the overall survival from about 50% to about 70%. And Historically, also, the, there was always a question of, is there, um, does T cell versus B cell do better or worse? And again, when we adjusted our recipe, so to speak, um, the outcomes are very similar, no, no matter what phenotype that you have. So TALL, it is a rare, it is a very rare tumor. Um, it, it, ALL in general, there's about 6,600 new cases estimated to be diagnosed in 2023. Um, and TALL makes up about 25% of those. So it is rare, but it, um, it is primarily a diagnosis of our young adult patients with a median age of 28 years old. And in addition, the male to female um, incidence is about three to one. There's also a higher incidence in, his, in Hispanic and, and black populations. So we think that this is a very important area to target. Um, our prior study, the CALGB 10403, um, the, so the, again, the, the SEER incidence for ALL and Hispanic populations is, was about 40%, but our enrollment on CLGB10403 was only about 15% of it represented by Hispanic patients. Um, they are known to have a worse outcome, but if they were in, actually enrolled on the trial, and there's a publication on this, um, that if they were more likely to adhere to these prolonged regimens, and then their outcomes were equal to um, the, the rest of the study population. So again, we really want to focus on increasing the accrual and, and benefiting patients who are struggling with this disease. Um, but so back to TALL. So it is curable for children and, and about 70% of our young adult patients with our contemporary frontline therapies, but around 30% of adult patients will have subclinical disease or MRD following induction and consolidation therapy. And this is our most important factor for relapse, just like in other tumors that you've already talked about. Um, unlike in BALL, where we have a lot of new medicines, especially immunotherapy medicines in the form of antibody therapy and CAR-T therapy, we do not have any of that for TALL. So we have no, we have no good salvage regimens. So once a patient with TALL has relapsed, their overall survival is less than 10%. In my own clinic, I have never salvaged a patient with TALL. I have never had one Sur survive a relapse. Um, so nilarabine is the only drug that's FDA approved, and that was approved many years ago for relapse refractory TALL. We are now incorporating nilarabine into our frontline regimen. And like I said, there's no novel immunotherapies or targeted therapies approved yet. There are some very early studies ongoing phase one that are developing CAR-T, off-the-shelf CAR-T, and some auto CAR-Ts for TALL. Um, but again, they're early phase. Um, so the study design that we came up with was based on um, evidence from several lymphoid malignancies that use BCL2, BTL, the BCL2 pathway to evade apoptosis. Um, and in TALL, what's unique about it, or what's very interesting biologically, is that the maturation state of the T lymphoblast determines the specific BCL2 protein on which it will depend for survival. So for example, in a very immature subtype of TALL, um, something called ETP ALL, they, they have higher levels of expression of BCL2 and relatively lower expression of, of the BCLXL while very mature, more mature subtypes of TLL express lower levels of BCL2 and overexpress BCLX. 
So there was a, a phase one study that was conducted um, for patients with relapse AOL. Um, and as you know, venetoclax is a selective BCL2 inhibitor um, and that's widely used in hematologic malignancies. And nevitoclax is a broader um, BCL2 protein and it inhibits BCL2, BCLX, and BCLXW, BCLW. Um, there's a, a laboratory technique to detect which, what kind of cell type, uh, it, their dependencies on which BCL2 pro protein that they're dependent for cell survival, and that's called BH3 profiling. And this has, sh um, again, shown that in relapse refractory TALL, and I'll show you on the next slide, the bulk blast population seems to be more BCL2 dependent at the time of study, but then at the time of progression, it becomes more dependent on BCLXL. So we thought combining, or Dr. Stock thought that combining these two protein, these two inhibitors um, would be a rational addition to our frontline therapy. So here's the BH3 profiling data from the phase one trial that used um, venetoclax and nevitoclax in relapsed refractory patients, both B and TALL were included and children were included as well. Um, and you can see in the red box below that those are the T cell patients and that many of the patients were BCL2 dependent at the time of study entry, even at relapse, but then became BCLX or, you know, they, they switched their dependencies. So we really think in, in TALL that this could help us to eliminate resistant populations very early on in the treatment, which is what we think is the most important strategy to prevent relapse. Um, and again, because we don't have good salvage regimens for TALL, the, our strategy is really focused on optimizing that frontline regimen, which you can see here. There's nothing pragmatic about it. I wish we had a pragmatic study like in, in lung, but this is, we can't get away from a complex multi-cycle, multi-agent chemotherapy frontline regimen um, for our young adult patients with TALL. So this is the study design. There's three cohorts. I'll start with cohort one, which is the largest. It's a four-arm trial. Um, originally, it was, it was designed as a two-arm trial, but the NCI wanted us to really dissect the the contribution of each study drug to the backbone regimen. So, so we went from a two-arm trial, which was just the combination inhibitor to chemotherapy, the, our control arm, which is just the chemotherapy com, uh, control um, frontline regimen, and then adding it to venetoclax in arm two, nevitoclax in arm three, and then in arm four, there will be the venetoclax and the ven-nav combination. So our primary endpoint is the day 29 MRD negative rate. So all of our MRD, we've you've talked a lot about MRD today, it will all be done centrally and paid for by the study. We have a, we submitted a translational medicine, um, uh, B, BS, BIS, this quick funding. <laughs> yes. And uh, Brent Wood, who is an expert at doing um, flow-based MRD, and he has done the Children's Oncology Group flow-based studies for decades. He will be doing all of our MRD Um one of our translation and other translational medicine arm is to do clonoseq. So we were going to, we still need to secure funding for that, but we will collect samples and then we can do that in bulk, but that also will be paid for by the study, the study drugs. We just last week or the week before got final confirmation from Amgen and Abvi or Abvi and Genentech um, that they are going to contribute both study drugs. So that is also um, paid for by the study. Um, so we hope that, um, this combination will be safe. We are going to start with a safety run-in because this combination has never been done. So we will follow the first, all 10 patients, the first 10 patients that will be enrolled in this trial will be enrolled to arm non-randomly to arm four, and we'll watch them through the fourth cycle of high-dose chemotherapy, which DI, delayed intensification. Even though the study drug is only going to be administered for 14 days during induction and 14 days during consolidation, but we'll watch them through four, four total, uh, the high, all high-dose chemotherapy cycles, which takes around six to eight months in these patients. Um, the reason for that is that there's a little bit of background. Um, our current young adult trial for BALL, um, which we're incorporating immunotherapy early on in the frontline therapy, there was a toxicity signal in the in the um, experimental arm, and that was that occurred in delayed intensification, and so that trial has 
there's been a pause on that while the the study chairs investigated that. And so it was just by the time people get to eight, six months in, they're at risk for infection. They were all septic deaths. So so we want to we want to be very careful because both Naviticlax and Venetoclax are very myelosuppressive. We'll have guidelines for antibiotic, uh, prophylactic antibiotics and growth factor support. So this it is a complicated trial, but um, we will have we will also have bi-weekly meetings uh, every two weeks. Anyone who has a as long as the study investigators agree to participate in these calls, we can open up that safety run into all sites that want to participate. And we'll just have calls and talk about patients um, every two weeks until until patients get through that D, that DI course. Um, there's a day 78 marrow. Uh, MRD assessment as well from because we know that that's also an important time point. TALL has a little bit of different can, you know MRD clearance as compared to BALL. It's a little bit slower, um, but it's also prognostic. So, but the the primary endpoint we hope that we can we want to clear MRD early. Um, we have another study within the cooperative groups for patients who are MRD positive for TALL that Dara um, that's using daratumumab as a try to an MRD eraser, so to speak, and that's being led by Shara Dinner at Northwestern University. But I, if you have questions about that, we could talk about that. Um, there's two other smaller cohorts. Uh, TALL also. It, about 25% of patients will have only like what we, you know, mediastinal disease or nodule, nodal disease and not have disease in their bone marrow. But those, these patients are treated the same as TALL. We don't know if that's the right thing to do, but that's what we do. And that's what the, you know, uh, the COG does as well. So we're going to, and historically, this group has been excluded from our ALL trials. So we really want to bring them back and, and start to study them. So Again, we'll, we'll assess the first page, 10 patients for safety because they haven't been included historically with these kind of multi-agent long-term chemotherapy regimens. And then the second 10 patients will be non-randomly assigned to receive both experimental agents. Um, we also will have a cohort for older patients. It is rare that an old patient older than 40 has TALL, but we definitely have them in our clinic and there's no standard of care here. So we wanna, we wanna try to bring all these patients together so that we can decide for trials going forward, if they should all, if we could include them all under one arm. Um, so here's just a summary of our cohorts um, and the, the primary endpoints. Um, and again, the safety run in I already talked about um, and the toxicities of interest that we'll, that we'll be watching. But again, we just, we wanted to, I guess, bring the glucemia committee here. Um, we have a lot of really interesting trials that we hope um, we could, if, if it would help your uh, patients, I know, again, like I said, I've, I have, um, several, several young men who were in the military, um, at the time of their diagnosis, who then found their way, uh, to me. And, um, we end up treating these patients for three years. So, you know, we, it's a, it's a long, it's a long journey for them, but if we can be helpful or if we can, um, participate in the VA, that would be great. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Questions online uh, or in the room? I'm to make sure I know. I think we're good. Okay. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks. We are going to move on. Mike, you're up. We're going to talk a little bit about our storefront, and then we'll move on to some other things. I'm going to try to. Perfect. All right. Thanks for being here Saturday morning. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the VA storefront. So our site kind of started with that um, Hope Foundation SWOG grant uh, a while ago. Then we used that to get into Navigate. So we're a Navigate site as well. Uh, and then we applied for the storefront to see if we can transfer the knowledge that we had uh, discovered to to other VAs and really ramp up um, VA enrollment. So I, I my co PI is uh, Dr. Parmita Dada. She was here earlier. She had to go back home for her water. daughter. There's nothing. Oh, on this side. Yeah, there's nothing. There's nothing. You want to drink some you, water? You broke up the play. Was... If you can mute if you're online, please. Thanks, because we hear you. All right. So don't say anything bad, and no flushing toilets. 
<laughs> all right so the goals of the storefront was to increase va participation in oncology trials i think that's what we're all here to do uh, and just getting access uh for for our va and uh providing centralized administrative support so essentially a lot of it i think is when uh maybe sites that are a little bit smaller or even big sites that haven't really done this before kind of look at the look at okay how are we going to get started yeah let's do a i found a swag study i want to start and then they go back home and they go oh this is a mountain of paperwork and frustration that um that i'm in for uh, we wanted to basically relieve them of that and kind of help them step by step and create a maybe an sop to help them uh we've already and, and i'll talk about what we've done already uh, so we really wanted to recruit some new uh, va medical centers to be engaged in uh, nctn work uh, especially with swag. So this is, uh, so we kind of have this hub and spoke concept. So we're in uh, San Antonio, Texas, where the operations center is. So um, have a good relationship with swag. And the original grant was to have North Texas and the uh, Central Texas. So Austin and Dallas essentially be under us. Um, and kind of help them with uh, getting this trial started, getting regulatory stuff going, CIRB, kind of all those little steps that you have to get done. Uh, and then Oklahoma kind of reached out to us as well, saying that they wanted to get started. And I'm an inclusive person, so I said, "Why not?" So uh, we we I said, "But I'm going to include you in the storefront, even though it wasn't in our grant." But they were um, uh, great people to work with, and and uh, had some great initial meetings. So for us, uh, we started our swag journey under our ut system university of texas in san antonio but once we got enough um uh, accruals on our own we were able to make ourselves our own swag site and and you guys can do that as well if you're partnering with one and you, and you feel like you have enough enrollment you might be able to to separate obviously there's some political uh things and we've helped nav navigate through some of those as well um but there are some uh, we have we had to do financial agreements between the, our site and the spoke sites. Uh, the uh, storefront lead um, uh, person is Jen Whitehead. She's done really amazing. I think she was here earlier uh, in the meeting, and I don't know if she's online or not, but she um, really has taken on and, and is motivated to help other sites. So she's a great person to reach out to uh, from us, and we're, she's one helping us. These onboarding SOPs is what we wanted to do. What's just give me the cookie cutter, like bare bones. Who do I have to talk to? What paperwork is it? And then when they get their paperwork, okay, they'll send it to us and go, this is the form they sent me. And then we can go, oh yeah, we're familiar with that one. And we'll help you line by line, go through that uh, to get approved. So really you need to get uh, trained on getting your NCI, CIRB, all this boilerplate language from the VA needs to be inserted into that. Uh, so we've kind of simplified that for sites. Um, and then we'll do some, let's see here, uh, essentially trainings. We'll, we'll usually meet online and we try to get the ACOs from that center to be online as well as whoever else. So the first meeting is usually the champion PIs and the ACOs to kind of understand what's going on. Then after that, we'll have a second meeting and they'll usually need buy-in from pharmacy. You'll need buy-in from radiology and some of the other docs. So we kind of get them on board. We've had one where it was the... Uh, uh, staff uh, physician or the um, the head of the head of their VA on too, because if they're if they kind of get engaged and they know what we're doing, they usually get pretty excited about it, and um, it's something that they can uh, brag about from their site, but also provide another access for veterans. So I think a lot of people once we get them on there and we can get, we can talk about it, uh, most people get excited and things go a lot quicker. Uh, let's see here, fifteen SWAG accredited enrollments. Uh, from just in this this year uh, and we got yeah we got Oklahoma to join so so at each site so Central Texas we had our onboarding meeting um, uh, we're encouraging them to uh, navigate is having another round uh, of acceptance to their site so we encourage people to apply for that so we are helping our our sites uh, uh, with that application process just kind of say okay what did we include and uh, how can how can you utilize your sites uh strengths in that application uh and going through their their sops in central so north texas so dallas va uh has already done quite a quite a good job uh they do recruit some patients um 
let's see here. Uh, we met with their, oh yeah, they have our boilerplate language and they're also applying for Navigate as well. And then Oklahoma City, we had uh, our meeting with them. They've already got their NCI CRB, I think done this past week and they're working on the signatory. So that's the other part that gets confusing is who's gonna sign off on all this stuff. Uh, that's why we need the ACOS engaged uh, so they can work with, well, do you already have an affiliate agreement with your with the hospital, uh, with the university hospital that's th that you're affiliated with? So that discussion needs to happen internally so you don't kind of make anybody upset. Um, but we can help coach through through those types of things because we've done the same thing. So um, all the spoke sites are currently open to NCTN studies. Um, we're doing monthly support sessions because Navigate has great stuff uh, and the SWOG site has great stuff and they just need to know where to access those things. Um, uh, we're going to have quarterly meetings and then con really continue to grow our library of our uh, standard operating procedures. And I don't want them to sound like it's just another VA paperwork because that's what we all have to work with, SOPs constantly. Uh, but really, this is kind of a live document that we're working through. Uh, we're almost done with it and we'll be able to share, obviously, that's the goal. Um, but that's what we're doing. So I think most people are going to be up and running definitely by the end of the year. Um, the next step is to select your site. So we can go to VA data and see, oh, hey, you guys have a, a lot of stage two lung cancer. These are the lung cancer trials that are open. Do you have any champions for this? Who would want to take it on? So each site's a little different, but we try to have them pick one study that they're going to take through the process first. So you get real live uh, feedback and data and we can connect you with the PIs. And that's why it's nice to have uh, SWOG leadership say, who's the PIs for this? And we can get them on the call. So um, doing it as a uh, just as a process to get it open isn't as useful as if you have a champion that has a study that they want to open and they're going to be driving some of that stuff at that local site. So uh, that's these are all the things we talk about at that at that first meeting. Um, I think that was all I had. So I, I can answer any questions, uh, but we're happy to help other VAs. We're trying to focus on our, our spokes first to kind of get them going, but then um, and hopefully encourage uh, Hope Foundation and SWOG to open another uh, storefront. So we'll look at who else was there. And then we would basically share with that uh, site as well to to go through this process. So uh, it's been a learning journey for us too, I think. But the team is uh, that I have for our, our research coordinators have been amazing um, and a lot of buy-in from our site. So we're, we're really happy to share. That was it. All right. Questions from the room. I'm very excited that our first storefront grant is progressing like it is, that we can tell the Hope Foundation that the money has really been very well spent and already making progress because I don't think that always happens anytime money goes out and out into the world. So um yeah, so we wrote we'll yeah, after our next meeting, we'll probably write a summary to um Dr. Blanky and Dr. and and uh and and Joe Horn to thank them about this and encourage the more effort to go into VA because I think it includes our our DEI uh, portion of this and, and rule and all the stuff that we have trouble with. I think this is exactly what SWOG's trying to solve. So I think putting money in VA and, and helping us get this through, uh, especially with the frustrations that we've had earlier, but I think we've made so much progress even in the past five years. So I'm pretty happy with it. Thank uh, you all. Yeah, thanks for your hard work. Yeah, your thanks. Whole team. I have, a, I have a question. Sorry. sorry. This is Margaret Tickton from Cleveland. First of all, this is amazing. I just want to tell you and excited to hear that this is going on. Um, we're kind of doing this unofficially at our site, trying to, and I think like something like this is, is like just being able to navigate those websites to find the trials, pull them up, figure out how to submit them work through how an IRB amendment comes across, you know, that's not all obvious, you know, when you first start out. So I applaud you for that. I was going to ask when you roll it out, is it going to be, because like we're working on a lot of things that you have here. Um, there's just like the, the local SOP versus the NCI, NCTN, like SOP. Um, and we have been working you know, talking with other VA sites, and there's a lot that goes into that and a lot of language that's hard to to go through. And I just wonder how you found that process. 
Yeah. So the really, are you, are you speaking about the boilerplate language? No, the boilerplate language we finally got through, but that's a nice thing to know for someone that's starting out. You know, what you're doing now is so yeah. great for sites like just starting out. You know, we we had, there's a lot of stuff like we worked through that, like, just like you did, like we worked through it all, but would it have been nice? Oh my gosh, we could have just hit the ground running. And I think this is exciting, like what you've done with this. But yeah, I was we, just curious in your SOPs, like your local SOP, like the language between the two and figuring out who does what, it, was that difficult? Yeah, uh, for us it was, but now that we're doing other sites, it's actually, sometimes they just use a different term. Uh, it's the same process though, almost at most of the VAs. So you just have to find out what, okay, what term are they using <laughs> for this person or this committee or whatever. Uh, but once we figured that out, it's been going really quick actually. So a lot of it, it's not cookie cutter per se, but we usually have that onboarding meeting and we kind of figure it out and then they get a little homework to do. And then by the time they come back, most of it's figured out. Um, and, and we're happy to help you too. If you wanted to email, I'm michael.list at va.gov. And then I can forward it to my team. Um, and we're happy to ha really help anybody. But like right now I'm focused on the, the spokes, but anyone that calls, we usually will backtrack a little bit and go, okay, what, because it time takes a little bit of fact finding depending on what you did in what order. So that's what I be, we became frustrated with is the order of events basically yeah. that needs to happen. And you do something ahead of schedule and then you're and you have to go back and correct it. And it's just back and forth. So if I just had this like okay numbered, what do I do in what order? That takes a lot of the thing, you know, kind of discovery out of it so we're happy to help and learn from others too there's still stuff we need to learn and if we can change the sop i said this is a live you know document that we're actively trying to change and then we can slowly start rolling that out to whoever wants it yeah and it would yeah. be awesome to learn and work together and streamline it's so great that you're doing this i can't i, I can't yeah, imagine please. if we would have had this in the beginning this would have uh, been so amazing <laughs> yeah please reach out and um you know, I can share what we did and then have other people editing it would be great. This is Kelly Stratton from Oklahoma City, just wanting to say how much we appreciate the opportunity to be a participant as a spoke site. It's, uh, we were kind of a tag along spoke site, so, <laughs> which is even, <laughs> even more um, indicative of how helpful Mike and Jen have been and how much it's accelerated our program is just amazing uh, after years of work. Their, their months of help have been uh, much more productive. And so I would just uh, put forward the, maybe the idea that, um, that there could be a spoke site application as a part of the next Hope Foundation uh, series, because um, it may help you understand who's interested and what resources would be helpful, because uh, that's kind of how we 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 thought we were applying as a spoke site and but that wasn't the application so but i think that there would would be a potential for that yeah it's a great point and even more reason for me to write to the leadership of swag and yes. maybe put that in there <laughs> because there are people that didn't want they're like well we don't want to be the storefront but we want to participate and we want to get all this information um uh that's a good point you know and could we expand it could we be a southwest hub that'd be great uh so that's how i look at it as a We'll probably keep expanding, but we probably need more of those sites, but and more people joining. So, any way we can get more participation and make this easier for people, I think uh, it's going to help vets. Yeah, and I, I think we'll probably leverage a lot of the work you've mm -hmm. already done, and that we can bring some of that to the larger committee. So we kind of make it's not all on you. Yes, yeah. I. You know, it's okay. I appreciate your hard work. Yeah. I also don't want to just like, you know, I want to give most of the credit to Jen too, because she's worked <laughs> exceedingly uh, hard on that. But, um, you know, the pragmatic trial that was presented, things like that. I mean, if you guys can open studies and really try uh, uh, to get people on and show the power of the VA, and that, uh, you know, I'm always impressed when I go to VA because my patients are always so altruistic and they want to participate in the trials. Um, and we have another one that's in the GU committee, uh, 2011, that's a cis ineligible for bladder cancer. Um, so I'm kind of pitching that one too, because there's a lot of our patients don't have kidney function. And I was on that committee. I'm a co-I of that pushing VA 
uh, patients that my my patients can't get uh, cisplatinum because their kidney function is bad. Uh, so I encourage that too. But anything you guys can do to try to increase enrollment at your site, I know it's frustrating, uh, but I think these little grants just build on each other uh, and getting that little bit of support can take, you can take it a long way if you have some base support that we're trying to provide. Right. So thank you, everyone. Thanks. Yeah, I don't even know how to follow that. Um, yeah, I think he just took it. So, yes, okay. Yeah, so, Steve, just wanted to, uh, again, applaud Dr. Liz for your efforts. So this is wonderful. Yeah, um, we are also an LPOP hub at Long Beach, and we've been trying to do the same thing with Reno uh, and Las Vegas, which are our spoke sites in LPOP. So we're, you know, helping them. And, and I think having an existing site help another site uh, get started it is incredibly helpful because it's so many steps that it, it's really doing it on your own is there's no point trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, the one thing we might think about is uh, that as we know, a number of sites have expressed interest in uh, joining Navigate. Um, and I think that as you develop your SOP, et cetera, then it, it, those are sites which obviously are interested in participating in NCT and trials. So I think to all of those sites, uh, maybe if uh, you know, you're agreeable and you create at least a document and, and we'd be happy to come on board as, in, as sort of an advisory site, if you will, uh, then we can create a process for at least all those sites, whether they get funded from Navigate or not. Uh, if they're interested, then we can help them uh, come on board. Yeah, I can follow that up. So if you apply to Navigate and don't get it, that's another point of these spoke sites that maybe they just didn't have enough uh, current functional aspects to it. You're And you kind of get criticized because, well, you don't have any enrollments. Well, like, I need someone to help me get all, all the stuff <laughs> yeah. done. It's a chicken, chicken and the and egg. egg right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or I'm playing whack-a-mole. I'm running all over the hospital getting signatures and then uh, then it doesn't work. So, because you did one step before the other one. So uh, yeah, working with Long Beach and I worked there as a resident. So I, I know it very well. Um, <laughs> and those are all big BAs, you know, and I think getting, uh, reaching out, us helping each other is really how we're going to get through this. So. All right. What's next yeah, on our agenda? I was on my phone. I, yeah, I can't yeah. read it. So, um, all right. So we have. Uh, there was an agenda on the slide set. I don't know if that's probably at the very beginning, but uh, let me see. Um, probably at the very, probably at slide number two. <laughs> I thought that one possibly not, yeah, but that's okay. We can just move on. Okay. We'll just let that one go. Yeah. Let's get it. Okay. All right. So this would be the next portion. Um, I think you just want to go over verbally or sure. Yeah, so, yeah, um, we have you know been successful with uh, 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 disease committee liaisons. We have a number currently. Uh, Dr. Colonna from Salt Lake City for breast, uh, Mike, Michael Goodman uh, for GU. Uh, we have a couple now uh, for lung. Uh, Dr. and I don't know how to say her last name. Uh, Sir, Sir Lyons. Lyons. Yeah, uh, I'm probably butchering And Dr. Her. Wong from Kansas City. Uh, Dr. Ma from uh, VA Long Beach. Uh, Tom Chauncey, of course, from myeloma. And then uh, Dr. Yi, uh, uh, I mean, Dr. Park, for something control and quality of life. I think we have an application for leukemia. Yes, that's in process. And then uh, we have a couple, some other open spots in cancer care delivery, early therapeutics. Um, palliative intellect, did we have one? Not yet. Okay, we th we think we might have one for palliative at the end of life, cancer survivorship, GI melanoma, and prevention and epidemiology. So, if you want to apply, you can just uh, email us at va member at swag mm -hmm. So, if one of our attendings is interested in the survivorship, then we have great. So I think she's putting it. Great. Okay, oh, great. that's good to hear. Yeah, and we're, we're trying to 
through that process on our side so, so that it goes a little more smoothly. Yeah, and we've we've made some internal changes. Um, we've heard some feedback since the last meeting too. So we, we're we trying to make sure the protocol department personnel are, are more connected with the new liaisons coming on so that there's more um, committee uh, working group participation, communications and so forth, trying to get them more comfortable with their new roles and so forth. So, but any questions you ever have any, about that, uh, email the VA at member.swag um, or email Steve, email myself. I think I've been sending out enough emails. You probably have <laughs> lweisenstein at swag.org memorized because it's such a long name. So <laughs> please don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah. I, mean, I think one of the things we're real, we might be asking uh, some of our liaisons to do in the future is. Um, Certainly be in an advisory capacity on, on those protocols, but also bring back to us things that might be of interest to the VA community. Um, you know, it doesn't need to be a fully developed protocol yet, but things that that maybe the that committee's working on that um, uh, there might be some other interest within the VA group that we can, you know, assist that liaison with. I don't think it falls falls needs to land on one person in each disease committee if if there's there's some interest um so yeah if you want to go to next there was the graphs i think that if you want to scroll way down to those probably that possibly it's, it's up there number 60 probably 64 or somewhere well. yes uh-huh so this is just the uh, the accrual report, which is run October 1st, 2022 through um, April 15th, 2023. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this because I think Steve has a couple of very important things he does want to go through before the end of the, the meeting today. So um, the numbers are pretty self-explanatory. I'll just leave a few seconds on each page uh, for you to look at briefly. COVID is, uh, has been impacting still the institutions, as I've heard in a few of the other meetings I've been in the last couple of days. Um, but we are happy to see that sites are still trying to accrue. Um, some of them have maintained, some of them uh, maybe not so much, but the desire is still there. Some of the smaller sites I've seen have um, come up um, a little bit. Um, Cleveland, who was on the phone earlier, they're up um, from zero to five. Um, since the fall, so that's good uh, Good news for one. Um, if you want to advance to the next slide. Uh, Gainesville, um, for example, from two to seven. Um, Providence, uh, from zero to two, and I, I find that interesting. I had just met the, um, the coordinator from Providence at a meeting yesterday, and I learned uh, she is the one and only person uh, coordinator at that site. So to see that number, I thought was very impressive after I, I met her. Um, so, uh, and again, West Haven, um, who we have members present here, is, uh, as always, a rock star. Um, so I think they're going to have to be our um, here's how you do it group, um, maybe calling on you to perhaps help mentor some other sites and some of the paperwork and different aspects. We've heard other sites do have problems in, in getting through. So um, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, and again, just some of the general numbers. Um, that people are experiencing. Um, Audie Murphy's numbers are a little different than what Dr. Liz read, but again, we're looking at averages. And so that uh, counts for a number of difference here. Um, again, uh, and these will be available um, on the, uh, the recording uh, within a couple of weeks after the meeting is over. So you'll be able to look at these in the future. Um, next slide. Again, some some uh, have remained stable, uh, some have gone up and down. So, so we came from a total uh, in the fall from 46 to 71. And I think that speaks uh, very highly for how all the sites are trying to come back regardless of their issues in staff retention or uh, just problems in general with study barriers and so forth. Um, if you wanna go to the next graph here. Um, this graph and the one that will follow it shortly, I wanted to prepare these two. This graph uh, follows the current uh, report period that I mentioned. Um, I find it incredible on this graph how many studies we have. So we have some good numbers on some of these uh, accruing trials. As you'll see on the right there, uh, 2013, we have 20, lung map 18, and uh, NL, excuse me, NHLBIMDS at nine. 
Um, but the total number of studies, I think, is incredible that sites are, are um, accru you know, registering and accruing to more site uh, studies. And then if you move to the next graph, uh, this the reporting period for last group meeting, um, a significant amount lesser of studies. So I just thought it was a very inter interesting perspective to see what the sites are doing from last reporting period to this. So I, I really commend them for all the work and efforts they have been doing um, to try and, and come back and, and uh, be helping these patients that are in need. And then the next two, two slides uh, basically are for uh, this report, last uh, several reporting periods since 2021 to 23, um, you'll see how they go. And then, of course, we've got the COVID issue. And for that, I did want to show the same um, chart showing how COVID trials did take up um, many of the, the accruals for that reporting period, too. And yet we still try to, uh, we, I, I wasn't involved, but you all were involved in still trying to maintain patient uh, care and registrations during that time period, regardless of, of the COVID issues, so. Okay, um, any questions about the, those reports or anything else you'd like to see in those kind of reports? All right, so um, I guess kind of the the last big thing, and kind of I'm going to roll these last three items yes. kind of all into yeah, one. Have we have a, a VA program development team that we met earlier this week of you know how to you know grow and improve the VA committee and and our service to the sites and, and everything around that. And you know one of the issues I think that still remains for a lot of sites is is opening trials, except maybe for Dr. Liss's group, they've, they've got it wired. So, uh, <laughs> but but there's still several barriers within VA that I, I think we need to address. Uh, and again, this is probably gonna kind of go through the same channels as, uh, you know, paying for drugs and, and those sort of things. But, you know, what do we do about information security that, Everybody's got to do that locally, but it's really, it's this, except for where you keep your paper files room number, a lot of it's not different uh, across studies. And if there's a way to do that more centrally and have kind of a national information security approval, kind of the same thing in privacy. Um, also talking to ORD about maybe some alteration or a technical amendment to uh, some of our policies, the way I understand it is that if a protocol goes through full board review at the IRB level, it also needs to go through full board review at the R&D level. Um, I don't know that that makes a ton of sense for uh, these particular trials, which are essentially reviewed, the local site piece is reviewed at the, uh, at, as an expedited process um, and that there should be some allowance for such well vetted protocols. I mean, the, the layers of review and things that these go through, the, the R&D committee uh, rarely if ever would have any expertise to uh, really adjudicate some precise thing about these trials other than some some local issues maybe with you know, safety or something. Um, so present a case to ORD that maybe these could be done by designated review. I think that might help as well in some cases for the rare disease studies, because if you have to go through this months long process, when you have a rare disease come in the door, that doesn't make sense that if, if you could do more of a just-in-time approval uh, based on something where you're really not going to accrue a lot of folks, but you might be able to provide uh, a, a protocol to a veteran that uh, they might not otherwise have the opportunity. I think in leukemia, that might be the, exactly the, you know, the approach to use. Um, you know, have, have this global thing available. Um, and so around all that, uh, I, I think what we wanna do as a committee is really uh, develop tools in a central repository of 
of how to get to things. Um, I think our, our our San Antonio partners are going to help us along the way. It looks like they've they've gotten um, farther on some of these things, and we can leverage some of those things along with uh, the other storefront, Maverick, and um, develop an information resource. And I haven't completely developed this in my mind, and, and our group needs to get together of you know, a one-stop shop or dashboard or something where, you know, you can go and if you need help, uh, you know, let's say this one, one site opens a leukemia trial and the other site doesn't know who did that. I mean, we operate in these little VA mm -hmm. silos around the country, but for this group, we need to operate together. And so we need a central place where we know oh yeah, they're doing that leukemia study too. Let me call them and see what issues they had. Um, or even something as big as the Pragmatica trial, uh, what other sites are doing that and how can I make that happen? I know on the research pharmacist side, we do a lot of that with just a listserv, but it would be, you know, we could do that, uh, that kind of thing, as well as a, a SharePoint site or, or some other thing that uh, not only has a lot of that content, but points to the other places and identifies individuals involved. So you know who to talk to. I mean, I think a lot of times that's, mm -hmm. that's it's like, like Mike was saying, that uh, just like you don't even know where to start. Like so. a mentoring or tools of the trade type right. of thing. So, yeah. mm -hmm. yes, ma'am. So again, I'm not, but it, it, let's say nobody wanted to open an ALL which I would totally Okay, so, but if, even if there were, and I don't know, again, my experience is with young people who are active busy at the time, they get shipped home, and then they're, it's sort of like, go find a, a center to treat you, but if there could be some kind, of, at least to start, some kind of connection, you know this trial program with SWOG, any SWOG site, any, actually, any MC, many NCTN sites, maybe we could start that way for some of these rare diseases because they're just waiting to come back. My experience is that the first question I get is, Dwyer, you know, when can I go back? I want to go back. But there's there's a cost of interface, even going through, whether it's medication, the thing you go through, there's always this communication. And even if we, for some of these leukemia that maybe isn't relevant to many, many of you, um, maybe we can help in some of those things. So, um, yeah, I think that's an important point. And yes, even though NCT and studies at a site which is up and running are relatively easy to open, it still takes time. And obviously, for leukemia patients, you don't have the time. So even a just-in-time mechanism may still take longer than we want to with an acute look. Um, at Long Beach, what we do is uh, we've got an agreement with UC Irvine that uh, we are, and again, I, you know, we put in a community care consult. It goes through the community care office. I look at it. I approve it. And for patients who are uh, uh, like this, uh, uh, we are able to send them to UCI for participation in an appropriate clinical trial. And so that's one mechanism if there's a university affiliate where an appropriate study is open, uh, one can do. Um, but obviously there are other mechanisms, I'm sure. The other thing I was thinking is that, uh, you know, just to expand on your point, that if we make a, uh, you know, a SharePoint or a central repository of materials which everybody can work off of, um, we can, for example, the Navigate coordinators, at, as many of you know, made a coordinator's handbook, uh, which is, I think, uh, probably 100 to 200 pages long with a lot of screenshots and stuff. And that's very helpful for coordinators who are, or sites that are new. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, uh, that list, uh, you know, the materials that you are developing, um, maybe if, you know, everyone's agreeable and you're agreeable, they can be put on that SharePoint. But also, like, what we do with our spoke sites is we... For individual studies, if we have opened a study, we are happy to share those documents, like you know the ICF, including the boilerplate, the IDIR for pharmacy, et cetera. And of course, the local site will fine tune them to their site, but it really helps them do it much more quickly. So there again, if we make a national um, SharePoint, then whichever site has a study open, they can upload their study-related right. documents yeah. to that as well. And people can download off of that and, and use them. So I think that might increase the efficiency of the whole process as well. 
Yeah, I think the Maverick site, and you guys on the call from Maverick can correct me, but I think you guys did that through Teams or something similar to that yeah. Yeah, for a Navigate while. Yeah, has a SharePoint 2 that we've worked through. So, and and West Haven's done great stuff. And and so there's other VAs, on, and I'm not saying that we're the first to, to do this stuff, but, um, and, and Navigate's really helped with organizing everybody to do that. And they have great coordinators that have been helping us too. So um you know i think going back and and seeing what we learned again and then uh just joining up with these other sites and kind of getting we, we've been pretty organized i don't want to say we're disorganized but um i think every site has a unique their, their own unique challenges you know and you kind of have to work through it so it's almost that's why i think this this spoke and wheel process is helpful because now you're getting more personalized care instead of just the sharepoint it, it, sometimes it works but usually even getting the sharepoint like I, I can't get to it one. And then two, it's like, uh, when I talk to somebody, they're just like almost they're kind of throwing their hands up. Like there's a mountain to climb and, you know, let's go one step at a time rather than just looking at it and going, nope, that that's too much. Right. <laughs> and so, and so I think the difference between what navigate and the SharePoint, and they've done a lot of work on these, uh, stuff. So we're building off what they did. Um, but it's the personalized piece and getting to talk to somebody and going, okay, who, who needs to be in the room and how do you go through it? So I think that personal piece is, is probably what the difference between the storefront is than the SharePoint stuff, just to, right. just yeah. to give credit. Where you credit definitely need that, you know, personal yeah. mentor. Well, I was going to insert too, um, I, we're, we're kind of a work in process or we have not um, worked much on our VA workbench on the SWOG website for some time. And we've slowly started to work on that in the last few months. And we just did some updates um, last week, in fact. And I don't know, um, you know, VA regulations and so forth, how much of some of this stuff we can put on there. But these ideas are really wonderful that you're suggesting today. And if if some or all of these things we can also insert into our VA workbench, you know, if you can't get into SharePoint or it's too frustrating perhaps to get into that, that um, these are things I'd like to look into seeing it, how much of this we can put in, at least in part, so that this will be another option for a resource uh, where sites can go to how to this or this site did this or here's at least some documents to get you all started. So these are things we'll be looking at for our website as well. Yeah, I, I think another thing to bring up, and you know, Steve, you know, along the lines of what you mentioned, is that you know the, the, the intricacies of the uh, R&D offices are, um, it, it's, it's a wide range, it's a huge spread. And uh, you know, when I first started looking at you know, becoming a SWAG site, you know, I looked at the CRB process and, and I saw that you could potentially get CRB approval within seven days. And I started thinking, wow, we could treat rare tumors here. We could see a patient potentially, you know, within a few weeks, you know, we could have a patient on trial if we didn't have anything better for them, uh, you know, like your, your ALL patients. And, um, but then reality struck when we tried to go through the process, our, our um, VA created a very complicated process for uh, approving NCTN uh, patients uh, studies. It's actually more complicated and more paperwork to do an NCTN approval at, at our site than it is an industry trial. Wow! So we have a three-step process. It has to get basically you have to submit all the paperwork, and it's a lot of a lot of paperwork. It has to go to uh, R and D. They have to pre-approve it before they'll let you submit to the central RD, and then it has to go on to a uh, full board approval approval. And if it if the timing hits right, maybe you'll catch them this month, maybe you'll catch them the next month. And, um, you know, they're liable to find something that they don't like. And so, and so I, you know, if we can get a study up, up and running within, within, you know, five, six months, that's pretty good for us. Um, and, um, you know, there's really, they, they just don't have the sense of urgency that we have, you know, people who are seeing patients and, you know, having to face these patients and knowing that, you know, potentially be something, you know, we can offer them, but, but we can't because it's sitting in uh, sitting on someone's desk in the R&D office. So that's why I think it really would pay to have um, Rachel Ramoni, uh, you know, at least set expectations. Um, and the other other thing, you know, for example, is that, that, um, you, you know, we, none of our PIs have protected time to do studies, uh, because of you know their SOP, it says basically for a study for 
an investigator to get protected time, you, the study has to bring in X amount of dollars. So $50,000. And none of the SWOG studies bring in $50,000. So none of the none of the PIs, they're doing it on their own time. Yeah, so yeah. that's why we really do need leadership to weigh in. Yes. And we are happy to uh, provide you know, plenty of cases if you need examples. That's exactly what's going to be my next yeah. point. Is because I, I think, you know, all too often I've, you know, reached up to Rachel or whoever else in ORG and say, you know, this is taking too long. And it's more just like, you know, the random complaint. I, I think we need to hit them with data. And I think, you know, a five to six month time frame, I think at our center, uh, it's a little more efficient, maybe three months, but that's still too long. Um, and I think in, in the case of 1800D, there was a, that accrued quickly enough that a lot of places just got it open in time to close it. Um, so uh, I think this is something we need to work on. And so I think we will be reaching out as a committee to sites to, to gather some you know, precise data on uh, not just timelines, but what is involved with making those timelines so protracted um, so that we can, you know, go to central office and say, you know, and with the idea that who's this protecting? I mean, the idea is to, you know, protect uh, veterans and, and, you know, even the institution in a sense, but, um, but is it really doing any of that? I mean, if it has absolutely no effect on that, it's only taking longer. It's like, what's the point? But, but you guys all know that. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Let's see. What was the other point I was going to make around that? Um, yeah. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention was that. Yeah, I was talking about this SharePoint or the workbench or whatever. And I think it might be something to inquire about possibly some, some grant funding for a person to manage that. I, I think one of the you know issues around our workbench is, you know, everybody's really busy and maybe doesn't have time to focus on that. And that's like a secondary or tertiary job for somebody. Um, and certainly the ops office doesn't have like the internal VA person. So um, I don't know exactly where that funding had come from yet, but I think there needs to be a person dedicated to, you know, building that and maintaining it. Because I, you know, I went and looked at the NCI central IRB um, SharePoint site that ORD set up and, you know, it's years old. The, the most recent document was from last year, but it referenced a document that was from, you know, five years before. Um, so, you know, we need to maintain currency with that. And especially if we want to put studies up that, you know, these are great studies for VA to do and have, you know, a nice dashboard of those. That these are things that you guys should consider. Here's a mentor to go to if you want to open this study. Um, that's got to be maintained in real time. And I, I don't think that's necessarily something you can do as other duties as assigned um, <laughs> in the, in the pro, uh, position description. So, um, yes, sir. So uh, a couple of things, uh, Steve, again, to your point, I, I think that, yes, it's very hard to do anything without personnel and resources. So I think that a SharePoint or Workbench or, you know, whatever uh, the, the, location is i think that if it's on the va intranet but it's available not just to the navigate sites but any va site i think that's what we need and again there's not going to be any patient information any hipaa right, right. phi pi and that so i don't think that there's that need for protection uh, from that perspective of any of the forms etc that we put on there so that will uh, provide uh, access to if there are a lot of non-navigate sites which also uh, have uh, NCI studies open. So this will serve as a real resource to them as well. Uh, and then I, I think, uh, you know, I know that uh, no good deed goes unpunished. Um, but I think that along with that process, if we think of setting up a, a larger sort of VA-wide 
um, this hub and spoke, of course, a very formal process, but also a set of people and sites which are agreeable, not to committing to a full mentorship, but being available at least for some questions and you know some limited uh, feedback and and guidance uh, to other sites, uh, then that might help the whole VA uh, as a whole. So um, I think, and then uh, the third is, as uh, many of us know, uh, there's uh, this. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think there's a, a, a trial, uh, you know, uh, trying to see if uh, some quote unquote vision wide R&D committees can be set up. That might be helpful. Um, and then also, I mean, as you said, the R&D committees are, as much as I can see, they're not really reviewing the scientific or the ethical part of, of the NCT and trials, but more checking is the ERDSP form done, are the IDIRs done, is the safety form done, is the PO form done. And again, if some of these processes are centralized, then that will take those out of that. The safety form will probably still need to be a local one. But I think we can work from Dr. Ramoni's office or somewhere to provide guidance to the R&D committees that for NCT and studies, you know, these are the two, three things you look at. And you, you do not do things like pre-reviewing it. I'm sorry, the VA and the NCI at a central level have committed. So sorry, it, it's, it's been pre-reviewed way above your pay grade, really <laughs> way above your pay grade. And so don't even think about this. So I'm shocked to hear that they're pre-reviewing and it's taking six months. That I think is quite unacceptable. I yeah. think, our, yeah. you know, NCI studies should be open within say a couple of months or so. So I think if we are able to work through some of these set up some of these practical things and also keep providing feedback both to our, uh, you know, VA central leadership and also SWAG leadership because it's a win-win for everybody. Right. Uh, for example, if we have one or two people at a program manager kind of say GS13 or equivalent level who are able to manage this so storefront or, or I think that'll be really amazing. I think we'll get so much ROI on that, both in monetary terms, as well as in, in the patient care terms. So I, and I think that if that can be cost shared between the VA and, and SWOG, for instance, uh, because it serves both institutions. So I think those are some of the things you might want to look at. Right. Yeah. Because I, I was you know, thinking if we share information around specific protocols and getting those protocols open, if you don't have a coordinator that is spending, you know, 24 hours on a protocol to, you know, whatever it takes to get it open, but can just borrow all these things and do it in three hours, how much more time is that available to? you know, find patients, uh, do do the other things. So, I mean, especially with the stuff that's just redundant, it's just the same. And so um, that's certainly what we're working on. And then uh, as, as our development committee, we're actually going to go back and do something that we hadn't done initially. We just kind of started doing the VA committee on the fly. Um, and so we're actually going to develop our mission statement and some specific goals and, and do all the kind of stuff you're supposed to do with, with uh, around committees. But so that, you know, we, we have a clear path as we go <laughs> forward and, and everybody knows what. Uh, I think we all know what it is, but I, I think we need to put it down in writing. And Sharon, did you want to add anything to that? What else am I missing? Was that? Um... No, I think if, if this is only the only thing, other thing you were yeah. um, or if things. there were anything on the chats that you needed to review as part of the last bit of conversation. Yeah, I mean, there's some comments here, I think agreeing with all of us that, you know, NCTN trials are, you know, government-based and vetted, you know, these alter, other alternate layers of approval are just, um, really not needed um and and i think there's always opportunities that should something look really weird to somebody they can always bring that up and it can always you know go back to r d or 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 be brought up it's but that occurrence is going to be so rare if ever that uh, i don't think we should hold up all the processes for that um we are getting close on time. Mm -hmm. A couple upcoming meetings. If you don't go to the Avaho meeting, uh, you should consider that. I'm hoping that we can get, um, I'm going to reach out to the Avaho 
uh, educational committee, see if we can get some um, swag presentation there, maybe pragmatic or, or something like that to, you know, broaden uh, the advertising for that as well. And, you know, maybe some of the things we do as the SWAG committee. Um, so that's like a week before the next SWAG meeting. So you can go to Avaho, just stay in Chicago, and then come right on the SWAG. So you can just- spend... It's just across the street, kind of, sort of. And then our group meeting, you know, it's the 11th. So that's September 29th, October 1st. SWAG's October 11th, 14th. We'll obviously have another committee meeting. And then um, we'll be sending out, if you are going to ASCO, there's a Conquering Veterans Cancer uh, program that will be at ASCO. Um, and uh, if you can't make that, I've been told I'll be able to get the recording of that meeting that we could probably share with folks. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'll try and forward the VA committee members an email that just has a, a blurb, an email about that, um, information about that to you all next week when I get back. And any other ideas or suggestions for us are always welcome. Uh, email us at our individual emails or uh, vamember.org and, we will, and we'll get that taken care of. Is there anything you'd like to see more of? Or have you been getting too many emails or are they sufficient? Or are they <laughs> anything less of? Yeah. Please stop. <laughs> Please stop bothering me. <laughs> All right. Well, picture groups, the SWOG is sort of unique in how much uh, interaction and support they have for the VAs, and we have actually. Yeah. It's nice to hear. Appreciate yeah, hearing yeah. that. Dr. Blanky was. Very, it's been very supportive for, for years for us. So, thanks everybody. Thank you all. Enjoy. Safe Take travel home.